so hi everyone. I'm Dan. I work on the uh, Linux user space team at Meta. And uh, I'll be talking about some of the ways we've been trying to improve system the journal D uh, with the goal of adopting it more internally. So a quick overview of the journal. Um, Systemd journal D is basically uh, the, the logging daemon for a system, which I, I guess everyone knows. Um, the way log messages are structured in journal D is a little different from normal or other logging daemons in that it's not just a single message. Um, it's actually a set of key value pairs. So a uh, journal message consists out of uh, fields with identifiable names and they can have whatever value that you want to assign to them. Uh, this log message itself is assigned to the message field, but then there's a whole bunch of other fields as well to identify other information such as the process ID, uh, which service the log message is coming from uh, and whatever else you want to uh, attach to it. And users can attach their own fields as well for uh, information that's specific to their application. So for example, you could put uh, an HTTP status code in there or uh, anything else you might want to think of. And the goal is to be able to use this information to then to be able to uh, filter the logs later. So you can say, give me all the logs from the service. Uh, give me all the logs from the service that uh, have this specific HTTP code attached or uh, more. Whatever you can think of really. Um, and then the uh, other thing is that generally the fields don't have a really have a limited size. So theoretically you can put whatever you want in there. Um, in systemd, we actually put entire core dumps in there, which doesn't always work very well, but you can do it. So to make this work, the journal has a binary format, which uh, is how the messages are stored on disk. And so I'll give a quick overview of how this uh, format is constructed. Um, the requirements that the format needs to fulfill uh, are like the following. So we need to be able to query all messages with a specific field value. Um, that's what we support now. And then there are some questions that I have with that is that maybe we should also support uh, querying all messages without a specific field value or with or without a specific field. These use cases aren't supported yet. Um, so we need to support the large data. Uh, we need to be resistant to corruption when we're adding more data to the journal. Uh, we need to be able to compress things because if our fields can be large, then we ideally compress those fields to uh, save on space. And uh, ideally, we should also be space efficient on disk so that all this extra metadata for logs doesn't cause our uh, logs to blow up in the amount of disk space that they use. Um, to make this work, we have the journal format. So this is an overview of the uh, current journal format. So I'll give a quick overview to uh, hopefully give you an idea of how it works. Uh, a journal file is consists out of a list of objects and the objects can be variable size and of a, they have a, an assigned type. Uh, and so we have a bunch of object file uh, types to make the entire thing work. Um, the most basic thing we need is a, an object to store our log message. This is the entry object. So this is basically uh, an object that stores a single uh, journal message. So it has some general information like a timestamp, uh, monotonic and real time. Uh, an object header for some extra information, the boot ID of the current boot and some more. And then it stores the um, actual log messages, uh, key values themselves. Um, now, if we just stored every field directly inside each uh, log entry, we would end up with uh, quite some disk space usage because every field can be large. So if we duplicate it uh, across every log message when it's used multiple times, we end up with a huge amount of disk space usage. So what does the journal do to address this? Um, fields are deduplicated. De so an entry object doesn't store the field itself, it stores a reference to a data object and the data object contains the actual field. If a field is uh, used multiple times with the same value, they all point to the same data object and you only need to store the actual field once. Then uh, we need a way to iterate over all the entry objects that we create for each log message. For example, if you want to grab the log message, you need to be able to iterate over all your log messages. So over all the entry objects, uh, and for that you have the entry array objects. An entry array basically stores a list of uh, offsets to entry objects so that you can iterate over them. And uh, an entry array object is uh, really a linked list. 
in that you can, whenever the current entry array object is full, you allocate a new one, you patch it into the previous one, and your entry array is extended. So then we also need to support being able to quickly find all the entry or log messages that have a specific uh, field uh, with a specific value. For that, um, the data objects also have their own uh, entry array. So that uh, and in that entry array, all the entries are stored that have that specific field value. So you can just go to the data object, uh, iterate over its entry array, and that will give you all the log messages that have that specific field uh, with that specific value. For example, the HTTP status code again. Um, so that gives you an easy way to get access to all those messages and also a fast way. Um, of course, we need to be able to find these data objects in the journal file. Um, how do we find those? Well, we use a hash table. So um, that's where the hash table objects uh, are for. So you basically go to the hash table and uh, you hash your, uh, your input and then you can find the data object that you need and then you can iterate over uh, the entry array in there. Um, then we also need to support getting all the unique fields, uh, unique values for a field. So for that, we have field objects. Um, they also have, they have like a, a pointer to all the data objects with um, that specific field. It's also a linked list so that you can iterate over those again. Um, and then there's also a header object, which is at the beginning of the file, and it just contains general information. Uh, about the journal file and pointers to all the other interesting objects. So from the file header, you can get to the hash tables, you can get to the global entry array, um, you can get to the end of the file if you need to append stuff. Uh, and that's more or less uh, a very quick overview of the journal uh, binary format. So there's a few problems with this format. Um, one thing is that if you use it as this, you still end up with uh, a file size that is much larger than the equivalent plain text log, which kind of makes sense because you're not just putting log messages in there, you're putting a whole bunch of extra metadata in there as well. So while we, we do deduplicate all those fields, so we don't duplicate the fields completely, but we're still storing a bunch of extra offsets uh, to those fields. And so if you have like 20 fields per log message, and each of those offset takes 64, uh, takes uh, eight bytes, um, then you end up with 120 uh, or 160, I actually miscalculated there, um, bytes per entry of overhead. And that actually is an overhead that is larger than uh, a short log message. So that's where you end up with like a, a, a huge amount of extra disk space because you have to store all those offsets along with the, with the entry. Um, another problem is that grabbing is actually quite slow in the journal, but we're not gonna discuss that further in this talk. It's also probably, I haven't profiled it yet, but it's also probably caused by just the amount of extra data that's in the file. So uh, I've tried to do a few optimizations to this format in order to improve the situation. Uh, and I'll go over a few of these uh, right now. The first thing was, uh, probably the most obvious one. So uh, all the offsets are stored as 64-bit in the journal file. Um, and the idea was if we limit the journal file size to just uh, what can fit into a 32-bit integer, then we can reduce the size of all the offsets to 32-bit. Um, so I am implemented this and uh, for a few specific uh, object types because um, it's, it wasn't exactly easy to do it all at the same time, because the way the journal format work, uh, works is it is mapped. So to be able to support both the old versions of the format and the new versions of the format, it's actually quite complicated to do when you're using mmap to access the journal file. So we did it for a few uh, journal fields where it was actually easy to change. Um, and this, you can see some results. This is not for every offset, but for, uh, I think only the entry arrays where we changed the from 64-bit to 32-bit. And we immediately for, got a uh, reduction in file size from, for about 500 megabytes um, by doing that. The limitation is that we limit our journal file size to four gigabytes. 
Um, then we have uh, relative entry uh, segnums. So we, uh, each entry object has a sequence number assigned, also 64 bit. Um, and we can uh, easily limit that to uh, 32 bit because a journal file is not going to have billions of uh, entry objects. So we don't need it to be 64 bit, we can make it 32 bit. Then um, probably the most significant addition was to use a tree to store the uh, offsets in each uh, entry object. So the observation we can make is that for a lot of the log messages that we're logging, aside from the log message itself, all the rest of the fields are probably not entirely, but a lot of them are going to be the same. Like every log message from a service is going to have the same uh, process ID, for example. Uh, and a lot of the other uh, fields that are added by Trinity itself are always going to be the same. So instead of duplicating all those offsets in the uh, entry object each time, we can store the offsets in a tree. And that means if we are using exactly the same fields aside from the message as another log message, we only need to store one extra offset instead of 20 extra offsets, for example. So um, I actually made another diagram for this one to see how it looks in the new uh, format, which we call the compact mode, by the way. Um, so we can basically see the entry objects. They don't contain the offsets themselves anymore. They contain a pointer to the uh, tree nodes, uh, leaf nodes for um, their specific offset. Um, and so the way it works is when we get a new entry object, we sort all the uh, offsets to the data objects, and then we find the longest, um, well, branch in the tree um, that matches all those uh, offsets. And if there's any that don't match yet, we append more um, nodes to the tree uh, until it contains all our, all our offsets. And then the, the leaf offset, we store that in the entry object to make everything work. Uh, we also need to be able to look up these tree nodes easily so that we can, for when we're appending, that it's actually fast. Um, and so we also have a hash table so that we can uh, find the tree nodes easily. And the key there is um, we basically take the hashes of all the fields and then we sort them together and that we can use as a lookup into the hash table tree. Um, I think I have forgotten to put the results of that in here. That's my bad. But uh, this is this was, was by far the most significant optimization. I think it was about 800 megabytes from 2.4G to 1.6G um, just by using this. The disadvantage here is that when you're actually looping over your journal file, um, you're not just when you're accessing an array anymore to access your offsets that point to your data objects, but instead you have an extra indirect jump to the tree nodes in there before you can actually access your, your field. So um, I haven't profiled this yet, but I don't, uh, it, there is like extra logic involved there to get, finally get to your data object that you're looking for uh, compared to before. Oh, I did. Oh, so my bad. Um, yeah, so like I said, 800 megabytes of uh, savings. Um, so then there was, um, this is not a size optimization. This is an optimization to in make uh, appending to the journal file uh, quicker. So usually when we're appending to um, an entry array, we start at the front and we have to loop all the way to the back. So remember that an entry array's chain is basically a linked list. So we start at the front of the list and we have to go to the back. Um, that actually ends up taking quite a bit of time. So what we can simply do is we cache the final uh, entry array object in the linked list so that we can jump to it immediately instead of having to iterate from start to finish. Um, and by doing that, we can uh, reduce the time required to copy a 4G journal to compact mode in the compact mode in the, uh, almost by half. So that was another nice uh, optimization to find. This does end up taking a little bit of extra space in the journal file. Um, but given the speed up, I think that's probably worth it. And another one is um, adding a little bit more configuration to exactly what we store in the journal. 
So by default, the journal stores all the fields that you give it. And journal D itself appends quite a bit of fields, like process ID, the service, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so, sorry, this is about the, so what can we do? We can say all of these fields are indexed. So what can we say? Like, maybe we don't need uh, some of these fields. Like, for example, there's are fields, uh, I think for SE Linux uh, stuff, there's a field and there's some other um, uh, capabilities related fields. And what if we can say, maybe we're not interested in these fields, um, let's not index them. And this basically means that for that data object, for that field, we don't have to allocate the entry array that allows us to quickly iterate over all the uh, log entries that have that specific uh, field value. And so if we say don't index it, we don't need that entry array and we save space. And this again, with a bunch of fields disabled, also gave it another 400 megabytes win. Um, the downside is of course that you can't index on those fields anymore. So if you end up with uh, a field that you do actually need, then yeah, you're in trouble because you're, you, you lose that information. So in this case, there's like a, there's a trade-off to be made. You need to figure out which fields are actually important for you and which ones are not, uh, and then use them, configure them using the environment variable um, to actually get the savings out of it. Um, and then there was configurable field deduplication. And so this is about the data objects. The data objects themselves, they do take up a bit of extra space um, and they only really help if a field is used multiple times. So, because then you only benefit from the deduplication. If you only, if your, if your field value is unique, then you don't gain anything from the data object because you're adding a bunch of extra stuff uh, without really benefiting from the deduplication that it provides. And a very good example of this is the log messages themselves. Um, while they do get reused sometimes, often a, journal, a log message is going to be unique because there's going to be like, I don't know, a file size in there or whatever, uh, or an error that doesn't repeat itself. And that means you're allocating a data object, but you're not doing any deduplication. And so what I implemented was a way to store the uh, unique field values into the log entry itself which means that you're not allocating a data object uh, and that way you can save more space. Um, this one didn't do as much. So this was on top of all the other optimizations already, but uh, we still ended up with a 200 megabytes uh, file sa savings to, to implement this. Note that by doing this, you really imply the uh, non-indexing as well because to be able to do the indexing, you need a data object. So if you don't even have the data object, you can't uh, do the indexing either. Um, then there's some things that I haven't had time to implement yet. Um, so, but that I've like thought might also um, be useful. So the first thing is using dictionary compression uh, for, the, for what we use the tree now. So the idea is that um, if we're uh, archiving a journal file, which is when we're done writing to it and we're never going to write to it again. Um, instead of doing the tree, we could also build a ZSTD dictionary for the uh, object offsets that we were storing in the tree and simply uh, compress them and decompress them when we access them. And that might be able to give the same amount of savings as the tree or something close to it, but it would still allow us to um, it would still maybe allow us to have to jump around less in the journal file to actually access the data object. Because if you decompress the uh, compressed offsets, you just get an array again. You don't need to jump around all the file in order to find, in order to find the data object. You have a direct link instead of having to go up a tree. Um, but then that does mean that when we do archive the journal file, we have to basically rewrite it from scratch in order to uh, get rid of the tree and add the uh, dictionary compression. So that would be uh, probably a quite invasive change. And then another thing is if we decide to rewrite the journal files when we do the archiving, the other thing we could do is we could take all the entry arrays uh, that are now a linked list um, but we don't need the linked list anymore when we're archiving because we're never going to append another object. 
So we can basically uh, take the linked list and we just make it into a single entry array. We know exactly how many uh, entries we need in it up front. So, uh, and that uh, basically saves us from having to jump around the file again uh, when we're iterating over an entry array um, because it'll all be in a single array uh, without having to jump through the linked list. Um, I didn't add slide for this, but another thing we did was add a better FS compression for archive journal files. So because journal files and better FS copy on write don't really play well together when we're appending to the journal file, uh, it's disabled when we're writing to the file, but we didn't re-enable it when we were archiving the journal file. So uh, I added that so that when we archive the journal file, we better FS compress it. And that led to uh, a quite significant, I think, 10x uh, savings. The compressed journal files were like 12% of the size of the original file. So that was also a very big saving. Um, the 12% is without all the optimizations uh, I did. Uh, after the optimizations, the result was a bit less. Um, but that doesn't work on uh, in-progress journal files, of course. So these optimizations are still useful. Uh, for that case, and for uh, journal files on file systems that do not support compression, of course. I think that was mostly it. Um, thank you, and my, any questions? Um, so, uh, the, the, the approach with the environment variables is certainly good for development and testing. But uh, should I be? Oh, now this is better. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, can we make it like, I don't know, uh, something that uh, if we do the rewriting of the files on archiving, and then look, for example, at the list of uh, reuse of message fields and make a decision whether to build the uh, like the additional data fields for that, or if the reuse is small, then skip it. And uh, to restore the uh, the functionality that is removed by the lack of indexing. If somebody requests indexing, then generate an index on the fly and store it as a uh, sidecar file. So that at least in principle you you get the same functionality under uh, but uh, more efficiently implemented. I think we could probably store maybe the list of fields that are indexed and not indexed. We actually do this uh, in the journal file itself. Um, but yeah, we would have to generate something on the fly, or maybe not even generate on the fly. We could, but we'd have to add special casing code. To even if something if something is not indexed, to still be able to find it uh, using the same interface, yeah, uh, as as provided by journal. Um, yeah, that could be something to add. Uh, well, how much difference is there to storing it uh, in in plain text? Like, let's say for a so without um, the optimizations. Uh, if I got a 70 megabyte log file, I got a 700 megabyte journal file. With all the metadata? With all the metadata, yes. The oh, sorry. Uh, so the question was uh, if that was with all the metadata included, and the answer was yes. This is probably a stupid idea because I've never uh, worked in this area, obviously. Uh, isn't it possible to sort of have one bare bones log file and then like a separate, basically separate log file with all of the additional meta metadata that you could later on glue together, for example, for archiving or whatever? Yes. So I've kind of considered that, but it's quite nice to have a single file. Yeah. I think Leonard can expand on this. So well. actually when we originally did this, this is where we come, came from. We wanted to have a secondary index file, like mailboxes, for example, are commonly done this way, right? But um, uh, the problem is, uh, like, first of all, um, like the main file was supposed to just contain the syslog files then, but they are useless because we wanted to store all the metadata, right? So uh, then you have to switch to a different format anyway, like of JSON or something like this to, to be able to store the metadata. And then uh, it just becomes very fragile because you, 
like I mean the, the the writing model that we wanted is not to have locking, not to be able to rely that the system is um, uh, powered off um, at, at arbitrary times. And this becomes a lot harder if you have two files to take care about that need to stay in sync instead of ha just having one. And that uh, both <laughs> like together. Yeah, I, I don't know. We like like uh, thought a lot about this, that, and then we. This is fragile. Uh, Absolutely. That this is fragile. Uh, absolutely. It's just uh, yeah. When you really want to come down to cutting a lot of stuff out, like a lot of uh, unnecessary metadata, then probably this seems like a straightforward approach. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, but coming like of course, I mean, I'm always on board with things that are basically are for free, right? Like like for example, um, uh, uh, reducing the offset size. That, that suddenly, I mean, there's no drawbacks. Um, uh, I'm always more more concerned about the other stuff where you actually lose functionality, right? Like uh, it shouldn't be behind va environment variables for a reason, I guess. But um, uh, one more thing that, that that I'm a little bit concerned about is, is like when we archive things, we archive things for two reasons: either because we reached the limits of the file or something like this, and then decided, okay, we need to start a new one. That's like the clean path, but there's also, and that actually matters, and in some cases more than the clean path is the dirty path, right? Like that. The system is, has been aborted abnormally, and we come back and realize, oh, this journal file was never closed properly. Now we archive it, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I have a suspicion that this one is the case that you that that matters, right? Like because in, in many setups, it's, it's actually you have more um, invalid, like non-cleanly shut down files than the other ones. But um, once you actually rewrite files on uh, on the object level, right, instead of on the byte level. Um, uh, you make yourself like it, you basically can't do this for corrupted files because of or like in, incorrectly or in, not fully synced files because they are basically corrupted and then you you have a problem. So uh, my question was, uh, um, does that STD also have some format that can do basically what Butterfest is the comp like compression can do, which is like seekable uh, compression? Does that STD have something for this? Because this sounds like the perfect thing, right? Like because you could do that. Independently of ButterFS, um, uh, and you could uh, um, do it with corrupted files and with regular files, and it just always works the same. Um, and you would still have, retain some form of, uh, um, yeah. Because I mean, I think it's, it matters a lot actually focusing on archive files, right? Like, because I have the suspicion that most systems, I mean, I think in the default setup, you have at least four archive files for one uh, active file, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so um, compressing those much better, that would be. Yeah, but I mean, it always falls down if you have, if there's seekable, seekable ZSTD. Yeah, yeah, it needs to be seekable. That's why I thought of the dictionary compression is that you can do compression, but like not everything, so that you can still seek through the file. But it's not a one like it's not an easy do it for the entire file. I mean, there is another option, which is for um for some container images, there's a push because uh with Z, with ZSTD you can um. You could add like metadata sections and stuff like that. And I know that at least for container images, there is a proposal for container images to basically where you can seek out individual files by path name in a Z standard compressed thing. And I'm sure that you could look at how that's done and presumably you'll be able to use the same mechanism for, for this particular thing. Um, I'm, I'm light on the details. I just remember that there is like a specific like metadata block you can add in the middle of a Z standard stream, which you can then seek through some mechanism. But yeah, anyway, the, the, the point that I was making is like, I wouldn't spend too much time in trying, I mean, you're also welcome to do that and on the active files. I'd always look at the um, corrupted files and, and figure out how I can we can save those things because it's probably going to be the majority of data like that. And it, um, like and that's a much harder problem, I think. Like because once you do compression, then access always becomes slow. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> figuring out how to solve that thing. Yeah, if only we could just compress the entire file and <laughs> still have it work, but then it becomes a bit slow to do all the rest. Any other question? By the way, just to mention this, the linked list stuff, I mean, they are linked lists, all these objects, but mm -hmm. they're also like, because every object is supposed to be double the size of the previous one, mm -hmm. it's supposed to not be O of N, but O of like uh, log N, the access time, because mm -hmm. yeah, if you have a lot of objects, you have only a few. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question. What's the status of this stuff? Are the PRs merged? <laughs> the PRs are not merged yet. So are you course, waiting? Course, yeah. Are you waiting for Mr. Leonard's blessing? I reviewed it last week or something, like uh, part of it. Yes. So 
the PRs are not merged, but they have been reviewed by Leonard. So I need to address the feedback, and then we can hopefully get this in a, in a release. Okay. Any other question, comments, anything online? Well, then, thank you, Dan.